Hi, this is Bob Costas, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. The ML Sports Platter back with you all over the major platforms like Spotify, Google, Apple, Stitcher, and Deezer. Please do download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review. We are brought to you by Welch & Company Jewelers, Stanley Law Offices, and our good, good friends over at the Vince Aguera Consulting Group. Log on today to vcgtransforms.com. That's vcgtransforms.com. Become a better leader both personally and professionally today with the Vince Aguera consulting group and a big tip of the cap thank you as well to Presswood Golf the Syracuse Fitness Store and our good pals over at Axe Exotic Pets man do they have awesome things going on at Axe Route 11 and Cicero if you're in and around Central New York Carl and his team they've got the lizards they've got the the, the birds they've got all of your amenities they've got rats if you have snakes they have snakes they have aquariums and more and basically food and uh, everything else you need for your exotic pets. So get on over to Axe Exotic Pets. That's A C K apostrophe S. Axe Exotic Pets, Route 11 in Cicero, if you're in and around central New York. Well, let's do it. Let's talk some Sabres hockey. Oh boy, is it ugly right now. Jack Eichel versus the Sabres, plus some training camp storylines and some early prognostications for this team. It's going to be another tough year. Who else? But Bill Hoppy, let's bring him in, the Sabres beat man and insider for BuffaloHockeyBeat.com. Get him on Twitter, at Bill Hoppy NHL. My good pal going back to our Bonaventure days. Rooming together senior year. Billy, how are you, buddy? Thank you for a few minutes, and uh, you're doing great work. And, man, it might be a long year again in Buffalo. Huh? Well, maybe not a mu- not might, but it will be a long year in Buffalo. Welcome back. I've been good. How are you, Mike? I'm, I'm good. So, Eichel versus the Sabres. I mean... Uh, who who do you, who do you blame more for what's going on, and how long is this going to last? Well, I mean, bl- blame is. I mean, there's there's a lot to I, I think go around on some levels. I mean, I mean, and then this goes back years. If, if you're Jack Eichel, you're frustrated because they're losing, and the and the, the Sabers have just I mean done such a poor job and putting players around him and developing a winner. But I mean. The bottom line is he has a, he has an injury, and the CBA dictates that he has to uh, foul the, the team's orders. I mean, that's something that's, that's collectively bargained, and that, that those are the rules, and the Sabres are sticking to that. And he wants to have a procedure that's never been done on, a, on an active NHL player. I get it. The Sabres are wary of that, and they don't want him to have it, and they want him to go with the next fusion and uh, – so we have this standoff. So I don't. You wonder just how this ends. You don't see any. You don't see any any anything on the horizon. Uh, is this going to drag on weeks? Is this going to drag on months? I mean, is he going to end up sitting out the whole season? But uh, it's to the point now where I mean, he could have had a surgery months ago, and maybe he'd be on his way to coming back to play. And and now I mean, what what's the best case scenario? He misses most of the season half the season i'm not sure but it's just it's just an awful situation it's not good for anyone and uh, it, i don't see it being resolved anytime soon so he, here's a, a a theory that i have I'm, I'm not saying that it is a realistic one but it, it certainly came into my mind while they're arguing with fusion surgery versus the complete you know sort of i guess the artificial disc replacement whatever you want to call it as they're arguing between those two things, do you think that it would, I know it's a huge risk and a huge chance to take, but if you're the Sabres, do you think, Billy, that it would be smart, at least a little bit, and worth looking into, to just be like, you know what, to hell with it. You know, just just let Jack Eichel get what he wants Hopefully it works out because that way we can actually trade the guy and the value, you know, then he's come back. We can trade him. We can all move on from this. Taking a chance. Is it worth taking a chance on letting Eichel do that for the sole purpose of in, in the end, you know, that result of being able to, to, to move on from a divorce that ultimately at this point is, is probably going to happen. We don't know when, but it will. Well, 
I get that thinking, but the thing is, at this point, whatever, four or five months since this first came out, uh, the Sabres have been staunchly uh, against this. And to let him have it at this point, I mean, they bl- they blow a lot of credibility. And, and, I, and I get that he's, he's your best asset and you have to get something for him, but it's something I don't think they're comfortable with, and I just I just think they're not going to do it. And at this point, I mean, if if they back off at this point, what does that say about them? That they, I mean, they wasted all this time and and, and so forth. It's it's not a good look either if you if you back away from it like that. So I don't think that's going to happen. To be honest with you. Okay, what are your realistic expectations for this hockey team this year? I I know there's a lot of new blood. There's a lot of young blood. Um, what what the heck is this team really going to do? How how good can it get? How bad can it get? Well, I don't expect them to be very good. I think they could be among the league's worst teams. I mean, you think about how bad they were last year, and they had Jack Eichel for some of the season, and they had Sam Reinhart having a, a career type season. Uh, they had other guys like uh, Rasmus Ristolainen and Linus Allmark and yeah. Brandon Montour. So they finished dead last. And they had all these guys, and now those guys are gone. So, and they replaced most of them really with uh, just some cheap free agents. So, I don't think they're going to be very good, but I think they can be competitive. I, I think uh, with Don Granado, a coach, a lot of those guys like to play for. I think they can kind of lay the groundwork with some of those young guys uh, f- for the, c- the coming years. So, I don't think it's going to be a lost year like some people think it's going to be. I think. If Casey Middlestead and Rasmus Dahlin and Tage Thompson and, and a few other guys uh, kind of grasp, uh, get a hold of what they have over a full season, the opportunity they have, I I think it can be a kind of a season where they move forward. They're obviously putting a lot of eggs um, in 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 the basket of Dylan Cousins. He's a, a, a young guy. I mean, can you imagine, by the way, being born in two thousand one? Um, <laughs> You know, you, I, I look at those rosters in hockey, and I'm you know, everywhere really in sports, and I'm looking, I go, my God, 2001, what? I, you know, I was a ju- we were juniors in college, you know, it, it, man, it's wild. But anyways, they're putting a lot of eggs in the Dylan Cousins basket, and rightfully so. What do you like most about the 6'3", 188-pounder, uh, Bill, when you watch him play? What, what can he bring to the table, and, and, and how, how, let's face it, he might, he might have a really good year this year. How good could he be this year? So oh, he could be terrific. I mean, he's just, uh, he's quietly one of the game's uh, better young players. And I think he's a future captain type guy. He's a guy who could score 25, 30 goals. Uh, and, you know, don't look at his stat line for last year. I mean, his stats weren't anything uh, great. I mean, he was a teenager. But, I mean, he, he just, he played he played a certain way that the Sabres need to play. He played with an edge. uh I mean, here he is. He's a teenager, and he's he's fighting to spark the team. I, I think I think he made a, a mark with a lot of the veterans, and he's just going to get better. I mean, he's only twenty. He's uh, he'll probably be their second line center. Maybe he can move into the first line role. But I, I think he just brings something that the team has has missed over the years, and it's uh, it's kind of a, a passion, a grit, uh, complemented with that talent that's going to make him. I think a very, very popular player for the Sabres uh, fan base for the next maybe de- decade or more. Buffalo Sabres uh, insider and beatman Bill Hoppy with us here on the ML Sports Platter, brought to you by Liverpool Physical Therapy and Barks and Rec Doggy Daycare. You can get him on Twitter at Bill Hoppy NHL. The Buffalo Hockey Beat available online as well. BuffaloHockeyBeat.com. I got two more quick ones for you, Billy. The goaltending situation, how does it look? What's the je- depth chart look like? Who's in Buffalo? Who's in Rochester? Well, right. I mean, there's probably there's four guys going vying for two spots, and that's uh, Craig Anderson, who's uh, entering I think his 17th season or eight, 19. I lost track, but he, he he's 40, and he for a lot of his career he's been a very good NHL goalie, well above average, one of the league's quietly better ones. Um, he's older, but I mean, he can still play. So he's probably number one at this point. Aaron Dell, another. Uh, a younger veteran who's uh, been one of the league's better backups at times in his career. He's probably two. Uh, then you have Uka Pekka Lukanen, mm-hmm. uh, the Sabres goalie of the future. He'll probably start in Rochester with Dustin Sikarski, a, a veteran who could possibly play some games in Buffalo, who was pretty good last year. So it, 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 
it, there's four guys right now. Uh, it's pro- it'll probably end up being Anderson and uh, Dell. Um, and I think mean, they're just keeping the seat warm until Luka Pekka Lukanen's ready. And is that in November? Is that in March? Or is that next year? I think Luka Pekka Lukanen will get games. Uh, he was he was good last year. But he's a, he's a guy. He's only, I mean, he's played only maybe, I think, 50-some games in North American pro hockey. So, I mean, he really hasn't had a full, full season uh, yet in the minors or anything. So he needs more seasoning. And uh, I think he'll get that. And at some point, He'll, he'll be up again in the near future. Okay, final one. Who's more important to the Sabres this season? Rasmus Dahlin or Jeff Skinner? Oh, I, I think it's Dahlin. Uh, Dahlin's the future, and he, he's had some struggles at some at, at certain points of his uh, young career, uh, especially in the beginning of last year. But uh, toward the end, he got going, and he was kind of his normal self. He was confident. He was moving the puck. He settled down defensively. And, I mean, I think in the next year or two or three, he could still become one of the league's best defensemen. He could be a Norris Trophy candidate or even a Norris Trophy winner. He's that good. And uh, he, he's one of the keys for the Sabres' future. So I think uh, as important as Jeff Skinner uh, could be, I mean, you wonder if he could get back to being a, just a 20, 25 goal scorer. Um, I think it's definitely Rasmus Dalin. God, that contract, man, Skinner, holy cow! Yeah. You know, and he had that unbelievable year. So you were you were caught, right? You're caught there. What do we do? Not bring him back, let him walk. You know, is it a Drury Breer situation? You, and then you you give him all of it. You give him the freaking bank. You give him an open book, checkbook, uh, a blank check, right? And now look at what's happened. Now now that contract is on their hands. He's got to be, he's got to be that guy for at least a few years to validate anything of that money. Well, I, I, the, the thing that surprised me is, uh, okay, he's not going to say he's not really a 40 goal scorer. Uh, you, you expect him to score, you know, at least 20 sure, or 25 sure. or yeah. 30, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's you, realistic. You expect yeah. him to be somewhat productive, um, just based on his career output, his age. I mean, yep. uh, it's not like he's like 34. I, I think he's whatever, 29, 28. So just, but the fact that he just is plummeted so quickly really right out of the lineup uh he was a healthy scratch last year uh that was pretty surprising so i don't think it's out of the question that he can get back to scoring uh 20 goals so all right well this was awesome as always bill hoppy covers the buffalo sabers buffalo hockeybeat.com go read his stuff he's terrific at bill hoppy nhl and must follow on Twitter. Billy, thank you so much, man. All right. Thanks, Mike. And the ML Sports Platter is brought to you by our great friends at Stanley Law Offices. Visit them online at stanleylawoffices.com. Together, they'll work to get you the maximum award. A big thank you as well to Barks and Rec Doggy Daycare, Sit Mean Sit Syracuse, Welch and Company Jewelers, and Rosie's Corner. It's right around the corner, folks. The cold menu items are returning. Meatloaf Monday, Turkey Slop Tuesday, uh, Chicken and Biscuit Wednesday, Fridays for fish, as always. Thursday and Friday, you can get your mac and cheese. Rosie's Corner, if you're in and around Central New York, right off the Bartell Road. Exit in Brewerton. They are available on Grubhub if you want to order uh, from there as well. And, of course, on Instagram and Facebook, Jason, Jody, and the gang doing an amazing, amazing job. Well, the book is out. It came out a couple of days ago. It's called The Baseball 100. It is by Joe Poznanski, and he is a terrific national insider and baseball columnist for The Athletic. He's been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, He's got an unbelievable amount of books as well. I've read most of them. He's on Twitter, at Jay Poznanski, and make sure you buy The Baseball 100 online where books are sold, major bookstores as well. Uh, It is an absolute gem, and it is heartfelt, it is engrossing, it is surprising. It's the Baseball 100, a magical tribute to the game of baseball and the stars who have played it. The author is Joe Postansky. Joe, thank you for a few minutes. You know how much I've respected your work through the years. You've come on with me multiple times. Congrats on the book, man. How are you? It's great to be back. Okay, The Athletic... uh, 
pieces that you did with the baseball 100, it, I, I couldn't get enough of it. I, I was dying every single time. I'm like, oh, who's going to be the next one? You know, what's 43? I can't wait till the next one comes out. Now it's in a book version. It's updated. It's called the Baseball 100. Uh, how much of it is updated, Joe? Quite a bit. Uh, every essay has been, uh, you know, at least updated. I wanted to turn it into a full, uh, you know, a book where, where it's something where if you wanted to read it from beginning to end, uh, you know, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it was interesting when I did it to see how much of the, of the stuff that I did in the live series just sort of, uh, you know, it was, it was news of the day or something. So to turn it into a book that, you know, you hope will last for, for a long time. Uh, there was a lot of work. There's a new introduction, a new statistical thing in there. There's a there's a foreword from George Will. So it's uh, I, I like to think of it as a whole new thing. I know that you know you're, you're one of those great media people who has the the idea that hey you know it, look this stuff is argue arguable all the time right I mean it's generational it's somebody says Ted Williams somebody says you know Babe Ruth somebody says Mickey Mantle the other one says Joe DiMaggio. Um, as you went on through it, what can you give my listeners an idea of how the 100 were compiled? Like, did, how much did you look at generation, the percentage of what they did in the era, the Negro Leagues? What what was the, you know, kind of the makeup of how you did it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I, I really, it was sort of a two or three part uh, uh, series of trying to figure out how to do this. The first part was putting together a list that was a pure statistical list. And I, I worked with a guy named Tom Tango, who's a, you know, really remarkable, uh, uh, sports statistician. And we came up with this formula that, uh, that I think involved a lot of different things, you know, how, in addition to some of the things that people would know about, like war and that kind of thing, uh, you know, it's, how well-rounded the player was, the era when they played, you know, trying to figure out the level of competition they played against. So that was the first level, was just coming up with an actual statistical list of, you know, the thousand, you know, best players in in some sort of order. And then it was, uh, uh, you know, a lot more of sort of, you know, picking from the heart. You know, obviously we didn't have the statistics to be able to put in the Negro leaguers. So, so that was really an important part was adding Negro leaguers. There's a player uh, on the list uh, played in Japan. So, so that was, you know, adding some of that. Uh, and then just trying to figure out, you know, where some of these players fit in baseball history. I mean, I think for me, of course, the fun part of these, these lists are the rankings and arguing about them and all of that. But for me, this was, this is, my story of baseball, you know, this is, this is why I love the game, why I think a lot of us love the game. So it was, it was trying to figure out how to, how to write it in such a way that I could, you know, tell the history of baseball through these hundred players. And and there you go. There's the baseball 100. You have, um, Willie Mays at number one. Why Willie Mays at the top spot? Well, I mean, obviously it's, to me, it was Ruth or Mays. I think most people would probably put, you know, you could certainly, make arguments for Henry Aaron. You can certainly make arguments for uh, Oscar Charleston of the Negro Leagues. I mean, there are other players you can make arguments for. I think it's Ruth or Mays, probably. And my, my, you know, the the arguments for Ruth are very powerful. He was a great pitcher before he became a, you know, a legendary hitter and dominated his era like nobody else. But for me, when you think about all of the things that an everyday player does in baseball, um, Nobody did them better than Willie Mays. I, I just think well-roundedness was such an important part for me of the game. And, you know, you're talking about, I think, the greatest defensive center fielder ever, one of the greatest defensive arms in the history of the game, <clears throat> obviously a great hitter, incredible base runner, hit 660 home runs. I mean, he just did everything and, and brought this level of joy to the game. You know, I think as I write in there, it's like every time, you think about any great thing in baseball, you know, it's, it's, it's Willie Mays was at the heart of it. So at the end of the day, he was my number one. So Derek Jeter comes in at number 79. He was just uh, inducted into the baseball hall of fame. I was there a few, uh, a couple of weeks back. Awesome. Um, yes. Such a special day. So glad we got it in. And you know, he, he's my favorite player of all time. And you know, we defend our guys, right? We defend our sure. childhood guys. We defend the people. Or on our favorite teams, 
we have a little bit of that bias, right, because of the passion for the sport that we had before we turned into to media people, and in my sense, a media in, in my particular situation, a media goof. Um, Derek Jeter is 79. Now, I would have him ahead of Kershaw. I'd have him ahead of Robin Roberts. I'd have him ahead of Monty Irvin. I'd have him ahead of Gaylord Perry. I'd have him ahead of a lot of guys, Arky Vaughn, uh, you know, who, who you have on the list. But you had Jeter at 79. What was the thinking going into Jeter at, at that spot, number one? And more than that, on top of that, how much, how difficult was it for you to play into the list, your bias, you know, you defending your guys? Well, yeah, my biases are very much in this list. I, I don't, I don't, I don't run from that at all. Uh, you know, I think I, I don't think it, it was an effect of Derek Jeter, but I mean, there's no question that how I view the game and, and what I value in the game, um, played a very big role in in uh in in the, you know the the way i chose the players <laughs> Derek Jeter, first of all i mean obviously one one thing and you know this I, i'm not telling you anything you don't know every player on this list was an incredible player every single player i mean you have the 100 greatest players in baseball history and and you know putting somebody anywhere on that list i think is 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 a great honor i hope uh because i mean there have been so many great players so many great players who didn't make this list. So I think that's that's a starting point. Derek Jeter was amazing. This is an amazing player, and I know you know your favorite, you certainly can speak to all of those things. When you look at the full totality of Derek Jeter, you know, he was he was an incredible hitter, he was an incredible leader. Uh, he he was somebody who was at the heart of, of you know the best teams of the last whatever it is, 40 or 50 years at least. Uh, so all of those things are true. And, and uh, so I don't have anything negative to say about Derek Jeter. He's 79. There, there certainly are questions about his defense. There are questions about other elements of that. Uh, and, and, you know, statistically, he actually was, was lower than that. I actually moved him up, um, you know, f- from my list because I, because I think so highly of, of the role that he played. And he was obviously such an icon. And, and uh, so nothing but good things to say about Derek Jeter. Joe Poznanski, our guest here, the Baseball 100, of course, out online. Major bookstores, go get it, where books are sold, at Jay Poznanski on Twitter. And uh, you can get a bunch of his other work uh, as well. Uh, I've read most of your books, Joe. I uh, have loved all of them and uh, can't wait to deep dive into this one as well. I, I know the list was extremely difficult from start to finish. I know that. But where did it get the most difficult? I think the most difficult was was at the at the bottom. I mean, the, when I say the bottom, you know, ninety through a hundred. How do I start this thing? <laughs> well, right. One is how do you start, and who do you leave out? That's the yeah. thing that was so difficult. Yeah. I mean, there are. I can tell you, for the last ten spots, I had forty players, <laughs> forty players, and yeah. and yeah. honestly, yeah. and you know how these things yep. go. Yep. You mentioned you mentioned. Uh, I, I think it was really cool the way you did that because it's really true. There is abs- if I had put Derek Jeter ahead of Clayton Kershaw, ahead of Robin Roberts. No ahead, problem. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, and I would have no, the, the list would be every bit as valid to me as a writer. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's like the difference between 79 and 68 and 53 is nothing. It's absolutely nothing, you know, and, and it's just feel and that sort of, you know, how you're, how you're trying to do it. So super tough at the top, trying to, to figure out, okay, you know, like, Number ninety nine on this list is Mike Messina, who a lot of people would not have put on their in their hundred. I feel very strongly that he belongs, but because Mike Messina is on this list, there, you know, Zach Greinke's not right, or or Eddie Murray's not, or Joey Votto's not, or or Shoeless Joe Jackson's not. I mean, there's so many incredible players that are not on this list that I wanted, you know, I wanted to be able to squeeze two hundred players into a baseball one hundred, but. Uh, Unfortunately, the math doesn't let you do that. I'll tell you what's wild too is is you think about you think about a player. Somebody says Tony Gwynn. I mean, is it assumed that he's a top one hundred player? Absolutely. Somebody says Stan yes. Musial. Duh. Mantle. Duh. Dimaggio. Duh. Ripken. Duh. Jeter. Duh. Rivera. Duh. You keep going. Griffey. Piazza. Honus Wagner. On and on and on. Go Hank Aaron and Mays and Root. You go one after another after another. Well, well guess what? Yeah, they're all top 100, but eventually you do get to 100, you know, and, and, and so it's like you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, that guy, that guy, that guy, that guy, but then eventually there, there are some, some guys who, who you have to, 
you have to leave out. You know, this this book, the cover, is awesome. I'm a big I'm a big fan of simple. I'm a big fan as I get older of easy. Uh, the baseball 100, simple white, right, and then your name in red and just a baseball at the bottom. How did you come up with that cover? Well, I mean, I give full credit. That's that's Simon and Schuster, avid reader, the the publishers of this book. Uh, came up with this cover. It was the first cover, you know, it, 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 just a little sort of inside book selling and book uh, publishing. Covers are hard. Yeah. Uh, every cover I've had, to, uh, you know, for every one of my books has been a back and forth and nobody likes this and some people <laughs> like that. And, you, you know, you get 40 different designs and eventually you find something you feel okay about. This one that was the first cover they showed me. It was absolutely the first mm-hmm. cover, and I'm like, perfect. It's exactly what this book should be. It's beautiful. Um, I got to say, it's you know, it's it's it is it is a book that I hope people buy and I hope people love to read. But it is it's a beautiful book. I mean, if you give this, if you get this book as a gift, it's like it's first of all, it's big. It's 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 900 pages, 300,000 words. I mean, it's it's a substantial book, but it really is beautiful, and that's. All credit to the publishing house. They they did this and and made it into this uh, into this really gorgeous thing. I think. What do you hope people say about it at the end? Well, what I hope people do, you know, and 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 the thing that's really been cool for me is, you know, I've already gotten quite a bit of feedback to it, and there's multiple things that are cool. Like some people say, "Hey, I, I, me and my me and my dad are, are reading this together, and we're arguing about it." That's the coolest thing imaginable. That there's some people that are saying, you know, "Hey, this is great. I read a different one every day, and and it's you know it's got me through." And I love that. That makes me feel great. But if I had to pick one thing that 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 would be like, here's this is sort of the legacy of the book. I'd love it if kids read this book. You know, I've heard from so many people who have said, you know, my I got the book and my daughter immediately grabbed it or my son immediately grabbed it. And I, I can't even get to it because they've they've started reading it and they're t- tearing through it. And I I didn't think about it so much when I wrote it, but I realize now that's that's kind of why I kind of wrote it for my 13 year old self. I, I mean, I, I, that's it's the kind of book that that when I was 13 years old, I would have died to have to, to just be able to just tear through and read this history of baseball one by one. So that's what I hope. I, the, the coolest thing for me about this book is I think there are a lot of different ways to read it, and a lot of different ways to enjoy it, and and uh, you know it's unusual to, to get to write a book like that that I think are that you can uh, you can attack in many different ways. Are you down on the game right now? No, no. I, you know, I, I there are things I am down about in the game, and I think everybody is. I would love to. To see a lot more balls in play, I would love to see, you know, the games be not shorter, but quicker. You know, I would love to see, um, I would love to see teams, all the teams trying, you know, and, and, and tanking just being, being gone. I, I hate that. I hate that there are teams out there really not trying to compete yeah. uh, because they, they know they can't win this year. And so they're just kind of packing it in. I hate that. I mean, there are things about the game that are, that I struggle with certainly, but I think all baseball fans do, but you know, how can you be down about Shohei Otani? How can you be down about, uh, you know, Fernando Tatis Jr.? How can you be down about Bryce Harper having, you know, this Renaissance season? He's the MVP. I think he's the MVP. I yep. think you're right. He is. I, yep. it's just absolutely incredible. I'll tell you what though. He's the MVP. But Juan Soto might be having the best year. Oh my god! You know, I mean, that's I mean, yeah. if Juan, what Juan Soto has turned into Ted Williams right in front of our very eyes. So, so I love the game as much as ever. I mean, I think it's still great. There are things I hope they do to make it even better. But, uh, but the players are, you know, they're 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 incredible right now. You know, Soto is a guy who I, you know, he didn't come through Syracuse with the Chiefs at the time. Before the the change was made, and I, he's the one guy I was. Oh my gosh, get him up here to. But you know they just did the double yes. A call up. You know right right up, and obviously he's not going anywhere besides the major <laughs> leagues now. But uh, I, that was one guy I saw. Robles, I saw Strasburg, I saw Trey Turner, I, I saw a ton of those guys come up. Uh, but man, that was one guy who I was. Oh God, I, I hope he arrives in the minor leagues. Um, the final thing I have for you, Joe, is just kind of. As we're discussing your book and baseball, it's the last week of the season. Sure. Uh, 
give me kind of your overall state of the union here on on things and you know who who's getting in in the, in the AL wild cards. My goodness, the Cardinals have been on fire. The Giants, I think, behind Shohei are, are the are the story of the year in baseball. Didn't see this one coming. They're in a hundred game winner. Uh, what do you have here? Just kind of go around the bigs for me a little bit. Absolutely. Well, I mean, look, you hit you hit all the high notes right there. I mean, you start to me this baseball season starts and ends with the with the San Francisco Giants. I mean, this is shocking, shocking how good they are. Uh, and and it's it's one of those rare situations where I think the more you analyze that team, the less it makes sense. I, I have no earthly idea how that team is this good. But they are. They're just as good. Everybody, they, they've got 25-man roster. You know, Farhan Zaidi is the is president there. He was one of the guys behind the A's uh, in the Billy Bean days. Brilliant, brilliant guy. And he put together one heck of a team uh, that in, in a way that you would never expect. I mean, it's a bunch of veterans. It's a bunch of, uh, of guys that uh, you just didn't expect. This, they're an incredible story. I still think the Dodgers are the best team, and I think we'll – See so come playoff time, but uh, but it sure looks like now. I mean, it was all but locked up that the Dodgers are going to have to win a wild card game before they can even get started. So, uh, so that's going to be super interesting. Cardinals, you know, they're they're going in so hot. I mean, I, I, I don't buy into the idea that momentum could necessarily carry you very far uh, once the playoffs start. But sixteen in a row is sixteen in a row. So, so that's an incredible story. Yeah, I mean, it looks like we're going to have a Yankees Red Sox wild card game that you know that might not happen. The Blue Jays still are in the mix, I think, but uh, yeah, and I kind of feel like we're destined. And the cool thing is, you don't know where that game's going to be right now, right? I mean, it's like if it's Yankees Red Sox right now, it'd be at uh, Yankee Stadium, I guess, but it could easily be at Fenway Park. And here's the thing, uh, and this is so weird, but I was thinking about this last night. The Red Sox don't want this at Fenway Park. That Yankees team is built for Fenway Park. With all that right-handed hitting they've got, that team, you don't want... They want to finish behind them so that game could be at Yankee Stadium. I think they've got a better shot of winning that wild card game at Yankee Stadium than they do at Fenway Park. So that's kind of wild. Uh, the Rays are amazing. The Rays seem to call up a, a new superstar every other week. It's unreal. Uh, and I still think they're... They're your favorites. You can't count out the Astros. You can't count out the White Sox. I mean, they, they, I think it's wide open in the American League, but I do think the Rays are the best team. So I think it's Rays and then probably Giants-Dodgers, right? I mean, whoever sort of uh, works their way out of that. But, you know, I think there could be some surprises this year, too. It's, it, it feels this year has always felt a little bit like, man, you just don't know. You just don't know. It is mind-boggling what the Rays do. I mean, yes. no glass now. Uh, hey, Snell and Morton, we don't need you, right? Like, and, and <laughs> hey, let's just go back and win, win the division. It's absolutely unbelievable. Joe Poznanski, amazing baseball writer and author. Go get the book. It's now available called The Baseball 100, Amazon.com and online platforms where books are sold and your nearby bookstores as well. While you're at it, I'm telling you right now, go get the machine on, on, on the Big Red Machine, the 70s, uh, Paterno, The Soul of Baseball, A Road Trip Through Buck O'Neill's America, The Life and Afterlife of Harry Houdini. It's it's endless. The Secret of Golf is an amazing book. I love that one with uh, uh, Tom Watson and Jack Nicholas. In fact, in that book, I remember the Tom Watson comment: "You're going to hit bad shots in golf. That's just how it is." Um, yeah. You know. So it's been amazing, Joe, to have you again at Jay Poznanski on Twitter. Uh, it is out right now. The Baseball 100 by Joe Poznanski. Go buy it uh, online where books are sold and your neighborhood bookstores. Take care, Joe. Really appreciate this. Absolutely. Thanks. The ML Sports Platter brought to you by the Allen Angus Pub, home of the best darn Angus Burger in town. If you're in and around central New York, get there before and after all the big events, Syracuse football, Syracuse crunch, concerts at the Amp, and concerts inside venues coming up as well. The Allen Angus Pub, the official Burger House of the ML Sports Platter. Tip of the cap, thank you as well to the Swan and Whitaker families, as well as your State Farm agent, Matt Graham, Welch and Company Jewelers, and our good friends at Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse. Bill Hoppy, Joe Poznanski, both amazing here on the platform. Hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports. Keep leaving those reviews, five stars, and of course, feedback and downloads and subscriptions are appreciated as well. And as I always tell you, enjoy the games. 